All right, good morning. Welcome to the 2023 Maryland OER Summit. I'm Jessica Clark, I'm Assistant Provost for Faculty Success and um, here at SU. And I have the privilege of welcoming you today. So thank you so much for making the trip over to our part of um, Maryland. Before I start, I wanna thank our planning committee, including Karen Silverstrom, where are you? Oh, she's gone doing something, planning. Um, Angela Lookabell from SU as well. And then our partners from the Kerwin Center, Nancy O'Neill, Ed Bridge, Louisa and Annika here in front. So appreciative for everything they did to get today together for you all. Uh, I'm, I have to say, I was amazed looking at the registration, how many people are joining us both virtually and in person. Uh, I think we have 40 different institutions represented today, which is just remarkable. And so I'm really excited to learn from you all. Uh, and in that spirit, I wanna encourage you to bring your institutional insight into these sessions today. Everybody has such a unique perspective, whether you're faculty or a librarian, an instructional designer, an administrator, uh, we have a lot of things to share and um, hopefully the summit can amplify our, our unique um, perspectives. So welcome to SU. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our 10th university president who has now been here for more than a year and a half, uh, Dr. Lynn LaPree. And she joined, uh, like I said, la a year ago this past summer after serving as interim president at Radford University. And before that, she also served as provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. In addition to an impressive record of academic scholarship, administrative leadership experience, President LaPree also brought with her extensive um, professional experience in the, from the communication industry. So taken together, that really has blended nicely to make her a very strong student um, advocate. And so in that vein, I'm very excited for her to uh, welcome you today to the student-centered event. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce President LaPree. Thank you. You know, it's, I'm glad that you knew how to do that because it wasn't going to be me. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for that beautiful and kind introduction. And good morning, everyone. We're so pleased to welcome you to the 2023 Maryland OER Summit. And it is certainly my privilege to be here to, to welcome you as well. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to Jessica Clark for her work on, on organizing this event, as well as Karen Silverstrom and Angela Lookabell from SU. And certainly we're so pleased to welcome you, Nancy, and, and, and your team from the university system to be with us today to talk about this incredibly important topic as we think about how we can advocate best for student success. And this is one really dynamic way we can do that. So it is an honor for me to be here, to be able to address you just briefly and, and to see this gathering of students and higher education professionals from across our great state's post-secondary institutions um, and to welcome you to the Eastern Shore and to Salisbury University in general, because I think we are um, actively committed to making sure that we can provide the kinds of opportunities for our students, as well as for our, our, our professors and teachers to be able to provide the best possible experience for the students that we have coming through our doors. So we can create that access and that, that air of opportunity for everyone who wants an education. Today certainly marks a pivotal moment as we are going to delve deeply into the rich landscape of open pedagogy and its profound implications for teaching, learning, and knowledge creation. And I am thrilled that Salisbury University in collaboration with Maryland's Open Source Textbook Initiative, or MOST, is hosting this summit, especially as we are celebrating, so I've learned, MOST's 10th anniversary, which is wonderful. It's an incredible accomplishment. Congratulations. Our university's commitment to advancing open pedagogy fostered by most in the most institutional grant that we received in 2022 positions us not only to participate, but also to lead these discussions about the transformative power of open educational practices. So at the heart of today's discussion lies a fundamental question. 
What happens when students, in collaboration with their peers, faculty, the community, and beyond, take the reins in shaping knowledge? Right? That's our question. How do we do this together? So this summit isn't just about theory. It's a forum for exploration. So we can find some of those practical applications to really make a difference as we think about moving forward. Open education isn't solely about resources. It's a pedagogical approach that champions equity, inclusion, collaboration, and innovation in teaching and learning. And it empowers learners to become active agents of knowledge creation and contributors to a broader world. So throughout today's sessions, we aim to showcase the diverse use of open pedagogy across various contexts. And as we embark on this journey of exploration and learning today, I also will echo Jessica's sentiments to encourage you to engage deeply in these conversations, share your insights, be that active participation, because only then can we actually mirror what open pedagogy is all about. If we are not talking, we are not sharing. And we wanna challenge prevailing notions, think differently about how we've been teaching and collaborate fervently. And I truly hope that that's the tone of today's summit. So together, let's work together to chart a course towards a more inclusive, equitable and empowering educational landscape. I thank you for being here to be part of this transformative dialogue. And now I am most pleased to be able to welcome to you, Dr. Nancy O'Neill, Acting Director of the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation to get us started. Nancy. Well, I'll say it now into the microphone, what I just said. Thank you, President LaPree, for your kind words of welcome. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Nancy O'Neill. I'm the Acting Director. Sorry, Jessica, I know you want to put captions on. I want to put on. captions on. I'm sorry. One second. <laughs> you told me that, and then I just jumped in That's anyway. No worries. Um, I'm the acting director of the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation at the University System of Maryland. I'll add my welcome to all of you to the 2023 Maryland OER Summit, Cultivating Agency Through Open Educational Practices. Um, I'm wearing a couple of hats in uh, bringing you greetings this morning. I bring you greetings on behalf of Chancellor Jay Kerman and Senior Vice Chancellor Allison Wren out of the system office who I know are wishing us a day filled with community, inspiration, and sharing. I also bring you greetings on behalf of the Maryland Open Source Textbook Initiative, led by the Kerwin Center in partnership, key partnership with Maryland Online, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, the Maryland Independent College and University Association, and our most recent partner, the University System of Maryland and Affiliated Institutions Library Consortium. Most provides statewide support for individuals and institutions to explore the promise of freely available, openly licensed educational resources to increase affordability, advance equity, and enhance student engagement and success. So you're hearing some of the same themes that we've heard already from the podium. We do that by providing a variety of supports, including grants, technical support, statewide convenings like this one, and research. We will be offering our next round of grants this coming spring, so I'm putting the word out there, um, and with an information session in January, and more information will be posted on the MOST website, which is listed on the first page, I think, of your program, or the first inside page. There will be many grants in both the adoption and the creation of OER, um, we hope with the deep engagement of your students, um, institutional grants to support campus capacity building around the use of OER, and we're exploring some new grant categories as well. MOST began in 2013, as President LaPree alluded, and so this year we are marking our in initiative's 10th anniversary. We're gonna have cake at lunch for those of you who are here in the room. I'm excited about that. Since we started offering grants in 2016, we have directly impacted approximately 160,000 students with a cost savings of just shy of $23 million. And that's with fairly modest investments, I will say. Um, and we're trying to figure out ways we could have greater investment. We could really triple or quadruple that number, I think, very easily. Moreover, and this is important, year after year, students and courses that we have supported tell us that they are much more likely to engage with the OER than they were or they would in other courses with traditional copyrighted textbook materials. Um, we think there are a few reasons for that, including the ability to have access to OER on the day one of class. So there's no 
worrying about having to pay for your textbook and where's the money going to come from and that might delay things. But we also think it's because we are seeing stronger pedagogical partnerships between students, faculty, and staff to engage in co-creation of OER, in co-curation of OER, and other forms of collaborative learning and knowledge production, the kinds of things that we're focusing on today. Um, before I introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, some thanks are in order. Thank you to our session presenters and facilitators who are highlighted in the program. Thank you to President LaPree and to the amazing planning team from SU, Jessica Carr, Karen, and Angela. Thank you to my colleagues from EdBridge, Annika and Louisa, who is out of the room right now, who support the work we do in most from ideation to implementation, every single facet. Um, thank you to our most advisory committee who represent the spectrum of higher education sectors and roles in, across the state. And finally, thank you to all of you who are joining us from all corners of Maryland and beyond. Um, our community is richer because of each and every one of you. I'm gonna take a minute to just kind of do a quick who's in the audience. So for those of you who are joining virtually, if you could access the chat function and tell us a little bit about who you are. We'd love to hear about, you know, are you faculty, are you staff, where are your, what your unit is, what your discipline. Um, for those of us here in the room in Purdue, please raise your hand if you are a student. Do we have any of our students in the room yet? Hello, back. Um, faculty, excellent. Uh, library, our library colleagues, wonderful. Instructional design, administrators of various kinds. Anyone else I'm missing, any categories? That was just a very quick sort of who's who. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for letting us know and for letting um, Robin know a little bit about who's here with us today. So a quick note about the program. We will have three sessions that will be streamed via Zoom, the keynote that's coming up, and our two featured sessions at 12.30 and 2.45. For those of you here in Purdue Hall, we'll also have two bands of concurrent sessions and a lunch hour for networking. Um, after the event, we'll be gathering PowerPoint slides and other session materials and making those available to you on our webpage. And we'll send you a notice when that's posted. So you don't have to sort of run after that presenter and get their slides. We'll take care of all of that for you. Um, and you can just kind of focus on exchange and, and reflection. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. So delighted that she's here with us, Dr. Robin DeRosa. A national leader in open pedagogy, Dr. DeRosa Robin is director of the Learning and Libraries and the founder of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University, part of the University System of New Hampshire. The Open CoLab is a dynamic praxis powered hub dedicated to innovation, innovative teaching and learning and a community driven approach to academic professional development with a focus on instructional design, open education, interdisciplinary learning, and increasing the public impact of the academy. If that doesn't sound like all the great ingredients of open pedagogy and open practices, I don't know what does. Um, Robin was a professor in the English department at Plymouth State for 15 years prior to moving into interdisciplinary studies, where she helped to develop a radically student-centered pedagogy for Plymouth State's customized major program. Um, I think we're a few minutes behind, so I'm gonna leave it at that because Robin is indeed the main event for now. So I just want to say thank you again and welcome to Robin. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, folks in the room, folks online. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Um, and Maryland, I don't know if you all know this, but has a pretty significant reputation for what you've done in open education. So it's a little intimidating to, to show up to keynote to Maryland. Um, so lots of you in the room, I think, are some of my heroes and mentors in this work. So I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you today. And for those um, who may particularly be interested in the alt text um, or also in some of the links from this presentation, we'll send this out afterwards. So there's no real reason to follow along unless um, some of the accessibility issues are are helpful to you, but um, that is the link to the slide deck, um, which is openly licensed. So after this is over, I encourage you to take them and use them. Um, and I'm speaking to you today from my home in Campton, New Hampshire. Um, and Campton is located on the land called Coos, uh, the place of the pines, which lies within the greater ancestral territory of the Abenaki and Wabanaki, um, the homeland called Andakana. 
I acknowledge that the Abenaki people, known as the Albana in their own language, have always been here and always will be here, and I'm grateful for their presence throughout time. The mountains still hear their songs with the drum and rattle. The rivers still carry the memory of their tears and prayers. The bones of their ancestors lie under our feet. In the American Revolution, which is my, my field of teaching, uh, the leaders of the American resistance agreed with the Abenaki that they would keep their homeland in exchange for helping in the defense of the North against the British. The ancient Abenaki villages of the Cusack were to remain in Abenaki hands forever, and the word of the American colonials was not kept. And I acknowledge this injustice. I recognize that the loss of a place to call home is immeasurable. I acknowledge the continuance of colonialism and oppression today. I'm committed to a respectful and caretaking attitude towards Mother Earth. I seek to build my awareness and learn so as to better amplify the voices and stories of indigenous peoples, uh, some of which we will talk about in this keynote. Um, and of course, uh, you're all well aware of the pros and cons um, and challenges and sensitivities of, of land acknowledgements. Um, but since I am not in Maryland, I wanted to, you to know where I'm speaking from and also uh, to use this in some ways as a launching point for what we're talking about today when we're not just talking about OER, uh, but we are talking in particular about open more broadly and open in terms of what it might deliver to us as we think about what it is we're doing here in higher education. So I want to start uh, with the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the fact, uh, which we'll actually talk about um, some more contributions that the UN are, is making to our work in open later. Um, but I'm not sure that everyone is aware that the UN considers um, accessible higher education to be a fundamental human right. Um, that is something I think about all the time, being from New Hampshire, where we are 50th in the nation for public funding of higher education. Um, and I don't think many of uh, the citizens of my state think of it in that way. Um, but open is pretty firmly grounded in the idea uh, of expanding access, not just to certain learning materials, but to this idea of continuing education. Um, but one of the challenges that we have with this, as many of you are aware, is that right now, higher education uh, replicates and reinforces existing power structures. So we're all aware of data that shows um, some of the social mobility, for example, that higher ed can provide, but we're also aware that in many cases, our own institutions, which you know, many times we love, we keep hearing our institutions don't love us back, but it doesn't stop us from loving them. Um, and even so, we're aware that sometimes our own institutions are not living up to the promises that they're making. And um, I, in particular, am very, uh, was very uh, um, affected by the research of Sarah Goldrick Rabb uh, when she published Paying the Price a few years ago. She was looking primarily at college students, both at community colleges and uh, for your public institutions, mostly in Wisconsin. Um, and some of her data was the stuff that really, uh, I think, in many ways, rewoke the nation to issues like food insecurity and homelessness for college students, you know, students who are currently enrolled, um, not even focusing on the students who could never have imagined enrolling in college or paying for college, but for the students who are actually in college and uh, trying to make it, she was looking at some of the real hurdles that were in the way for them. Um, you can see some of them on this list here. Uh, the first one there, 23% of low income sophomores working a job between the hours of 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. Uh, Sarah talks about how she had a student who fell asleep in one of her 8 a.m. classes and you know how gut-wrenching and offensive that felt to her at the time. Uh, if you've had the experience, you know I have had the experience and it's not a pretty one when a student falls asleep in your class. But when she confronted that student and found out that they had not gone to sleep um, since, you know, a prior day because 
they had worked the overnight shift. Um, she had a, a, a framework change in her head. Um, also, her research really illuminated that the food insecurity and homelessness issues that our students are facing, you know, depending on the demographics of your own institution in Maryland, you can absolutely guarantee uh, that a portion of your students are facing food insecurity and homelessness as they're working through their um, gen ed requirements and your majors. Um, the, the middle uh, uh, statistic there is a pretty interesting one for us in open though, that 50 to 80% of the sticker price for college comes from non-tuition costs. Um, and that can mean many things. It can mean everything from, you know, transportation or say child care for an adult learner with kids. Um, all of our students are adult learners uh, in general. Um, but it can also mean things like lost opportunity costs, right? If a student is taking, for example, a full-time load, which is required to receive some sorts of financial aid, uh, it's very hard for them to then work a full-time job, which might mean they're losing income they could have otherwise had. Uh, and of course, in that 50 to 80% comes the thing that brings many of us uh, into the work of OPEN, which is uh, the cost of textbooks. So when I think about all of the kinds of data that Sarah and other folks are putting out, um, one of the questions that I ask is for higher ed to truly be a tool for equity and a key contributor to the public good, what would have to change? If now higher ed is participating in exacerbating some of the equalities, uh, inequalities, that we see particularly for our students who are really um, struggling with poverty, what would we have to do to shift institutionally and in the way that we do our own little jobs, whatever they may be, right? And we know they're not little, but whether we teach or work in librarianship or instructional design. Um, this is a, a graph, this is the 2000, 2016 Florida Virtual Campus Study. This was replicated in uh, 20, I can't remember, was it 18 or 19? Um, but I always put the 2016 data up. It, the, the same data came out later. But when I first saw this as a faculty member, uh, this was one of the things that woke me up about OER in particular. Um, because when we're not, when we're talking about OER, we're not really talking about textbook costs being too high, which they are, and I will talk about in a second. What we really are talking about is uh, the much more popular buzz phrase right now, which is student success. Um, we're talking about students' ability to pass our classes, um, students' abilities to persist in our classes. Um, other things here are even more interesting for other folks besides faculty. For example, if you're um, a provost or, um, or in enrollment management, you're interested in the fact that students report that they take fewer courses because they can't afford their textbooks. 50% um, of students almost reporting that they take fewer courses. Um, that's really important because when students take fewer courses, they earn fewer credits. When they earn fewer credits, they extend their time to graduation. And when they extend their time to graduation, the data is very clear that they um, augment the chances that they will not complete college. So these are completion uh, rates. These are persistence rates. These are retention rates. These are student success rates. Um, and also these are for faculty, really familiar things like the fact that two thirds of students don't purchase a required textbook because they're too expensive. We've all seen these students in the first couple of weeks of classes in particular, they're sitting on the side saying, I can't afford it, or I'm going to wait till my check clears, or I'm going to borrow it from my friend because I can't, um, I can't come up with the money right now. So when I saw this, I really realized, you know, this is not some abstract financial aid issue. This is an issue about academic success. And if you are involved in any of the academic uh, questions on your campus, then you need to be concerned with um, textbook costs. And, you know, textbook costs are ridiculous. I mean, I'll just put it out there in case you think um, there's not a scam being run here. There is, right? They are uh, raising 
far faster than the consumer price index. This is from 2019. I haven't seen a new one given how obscene inflation is right now, but I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. You know, we're we're looking at textbook costs being right up there with like uh, hospital costs where they charge you like, you know, $180 for Tylenol when you're in the hospital, right? Um, and even the textbook industry is starting to realize that this is not really sustainable for our students anymore. So you've got folks like the CEO of Cengage saying, you know, there's millions of students out there who are making very, very painful trade-offs in the purchase of learning materials relative to paying the rent or for basic needs, food, et cetera. We as an industry have chosen for a long time to basically ignore that. I would say they didn't ignore it. They actually caused it. Um, and they've more or less been paying lip service to them. So I'm so glad that places like Cengage and Pearson and Barnes and Noble are now waking up to this um, epidemic problem of the high cost of textbooks. Uh, but the way that they are solving these problems is with uh, programs like automatic textbook billing. You might hear things uh, like inclusive access, which is a phrase that really drives me batty because they co-opted all of our words, you know, like it's inclusive, it's accessible. It's like, you know, get your own words because inclusive access is neither inclusive nor accessible. And uh, groups like the student uh, PERGs have done some really amazing um, uh, reports. Uh, one of them is called Access Denied, where they showed that these um, programs that are created by the textbook companies to solve the problems that the textbook companies are causing um, actually make the problems worse. In particular, what they do is they undercut the workarounds that our poorest students are using to get their textbooks. These are things like the textbook rental market, the used textbook market, course reserves. Now that you need things like access codes, you can't sell back your books, you can't share your books. Um, and these are because open education um, and textbook cost advocates have sounded alarms and uh, they have come up with better alternatives. Um, so I would highly suggest, you know, not that you never use programs like this, but you critically educate, particularly your faculty who think because they're called things like inclusive access, that they're going to be good for our students. Um, but there is clearly something uh, that, that has no ulterior motive, but truly is good for our students, which is um, open educational resources. And we see data just over and over again. And honestly, um, I was so impressed by your president, uh, who I think did such a great job for, for talking about the importance of open pedagogy, as we're going to talk about it in just a minute. Um, it, you know, really framing the successes that we've had um, uh, at, in OER and also how that is going to lead us to talk more about pedagogy. But I want to just highlight one study that is um, really compelling to me, which comes from the team at the University of Georgia and Eddie Watson, who's now at AACNU, um, which is about uh, the effect of OER on all students, improving course grades and decreasing drop failure and withdrawal rates, but also that there was a one third um, higher benefit for our most marginalized students. That included Pell recipient students, part-time students, and underserved students, which in this study was particularly students of color. So um, metrics like this, unlike the metrics that come out of our analysis of things like inclusive access, show us that we truly are delivering on the promises of access and equity when we move to open, um, but we don't exactly know all the reasons why. So for example, when we move to open resources, unlike just free stuff on the internet, which I am not against, I love free stuff on the internet and I encourage you to use it in your classes, but we all know the difference between open and free stuff on the internet is that open is not just free as in no cost, but it's also free as in freedom. And it has these 
five R's uh, that allow us to do things with the permissions of open resources. And I think most folks um, online and in the room are well aware of these things. What the open permissions do for me, and of course I do always, you know, reuse, remix, redistribute stuff, like I'm, you know, I'm into the five R's, but I'm also really interested in the five R's as a launching point for the vision that we might have about what it is that we're doing in open. Um, if we return to that question about what higher ed would have to do to truly be a tool for equity um, and not an obstacle to equity, um, what would we have to do? And what would we have to do to make higher ed be a contributor to the public good? which partially means starting to define the public good, right? What, what does that mean in our teaching and our, for our librarians? Um, you know, as we build our tech infrastructures, what is the public good? So I wanna talk about that question by launching from the five R's into open pedagogy. And I will posit a definition of open pedagogy, which I do quite a lot and pause it differently every time. I don't think it really matters, you know, that we have a textbook definition of open pedagogy because we're the importance here is not to define it. The importance the importance here is to envision it, right? To imagine um, a framework that we can use for building an ecosystem. So I think that ecosystem is dynamic. So our definitions can be dynamic. It's it's really at the heart of open that everything is dynamic because the five R's suggest that when you bring something into the knowledge commons, it is going to be improved. Um, that knowledge is not finite, it is developing and growing. So same thing with open pedagogy. Um, you know, I if, if I were a student of open pedagogy, I would not be bullet pointing this. I would be um, using this as a launch pad. So if we use this for Launchpad today, I've got sort of three positions that I'll uh, uh, that I'll put out and then ex explain how we might think of these things in practice. And I'll start with this idea of open pedagogy striving toward social justice. Um, and social justice is a very uh, loaded term. I think it's a term that we have to be braver to use now than we maybe even had to be five years ago, which um, I, I find um, a little heartbreaking and also a little motivating. Um, but when I think about striving for social justice, I think about maybe rethinking the word um, access a little bit. Uh, access, you know, especially in the OER world has generally meant like, make the textbook free, right? But there's some limitations to that line of thinking. Um, I return to our land acknowledgement, which really puts right here um, in New Hampshire, in Maryland, uh, puts colonialism back on the table, right, as we sort of acknowledge and then don't give back our land that we are living in a, in a colonial society. So sometimes the idea of access can participate in that, right? I have written a textbook, which I shall give the underprivileged for free so that they may learn from my wisdom. Um, this becomes exacerbated when we look at the rates of OER production and dissemination, that the global north is for sure um, the, the leading provider and publisher of many open educational resources. Um, and English is a dominant language in OER. So when we think about access, um, it doesn't mean we don't want to make our stuff free, but it means we might want to think uh, more broadly about what we need access to. It's not just access to the knowledge, it's access to the knowledge commons and participating in it. Um, I think a really brilliant person who's helped us move along, you know, a lot of us has been, have been saying this stuff for years. Many folks in your room there have been saying this for years. Um, and I feel like Sarah Lambert gave us a really nice framework for talking about this. Um, and again, when you get the slide deck, you can follow up with all of these articles. But um, Sarah talks about open education as the development of freely uh, digitally enabled learning materials and experiences primarily by and for the benefit and empowerment of non-privileged learners 
who may be underrepresented in education systems or marginalized in their global context. Um, this is a pretty dramatic statement to say that when we focus on open, we are going to move the margins to the center of our work. Um, and I find that really helpful, not just in, from a social justice perspective, but, but in terms of all of the problems that we're trying to solve in higher ed. When we're trying to think of who can't enroll in college or who can't complete college, most of the problems that we're trying to solve are the problems of uh, the students who are being left behind. I might also add in some cases, the faculty and staff who are being left behind or exploited. So um, many of the broken parts of our system can be addressed when we recenter our margins. She goes on to say that successive social justice aligned programs can be measured not by any particular te technical feature or format, by inst but instead to the extent to which they enact redistributive justice or cognitive justice and or representational justice, which is a mouthful. I will also say it's three more R's. So a lot of us get excited about talking now about you know the eight R's that we might think about when we think about OER. But I can uh, walk us through this a little bit more um, in thinking about these forms of, of social justice. The first, Redistributive is a little bit more familiar to those of us who work in OER. The allocation of materials or human resources towards those who by circumstance have less. So the idea of you know, making a learning material accessible to someone who otherwise might not have had access. Certainly for me um, as, a, as a teacher for so many years, this I, I see this most in you know, who on the first day of class does not have the textbook. Um, Recognitive justice, uh, Lambert says, is the recognition and respect for cultural and gender difference. And she talks about this um, when she talks about diversity in the open curriculum. So it's not just about making the curriculum um, available to people, but taking a critical look at that curriculum and asking who is represented in this curriculum, who can, who can recognize themselves in this curriculum. Um, and if they cannot be recognized in that curriculum, how does that curriculum need to change um, in order to make sense to the people who are using it? Um, that can be a little tricky when you think about representational justice because it sounds like, isn't that what you just said? You know, representing people in the curriculum. But representational justice is even more power than recognizing yourself in the curriculum. It's about having a voice, the way you might have representation in, say, a political process, right? Are, are, is your voice represented? Do you have power and agency? And that's where we see um, the ability of learners to affect the knowledge commons, not just to have the knowledge commons downloaded into their brains, but to be able to upload their perspectives and critiques and ideas back into the knowledge commons, which I find the place where as a pedagogue, I get excited because it transformed my thinking when I started thinking of learners as people who are agents in the knowledge commons, not just um, not just consumers of it. Um, I also wanna go back to Lambert's uh, definition there. And when she talks about open ed as the develop, um, is the development of freely enabled learning materials, she also says learning experiences. So what this suggests to me is that it's not just about the textbooks or the data sets or the content, but it's also about the pedagogy of how we teach and how we learn that we can think of as advocates of open. Um, if we wanna really stick with the R's because now we've got um, recognitive uh, and representational justice, um, but we can also think of um, this wonderful uh, list of six R's. So I think I've sort of lost track of the, the number of R's now. And this is why I think, you know, 
not important to have the bullet list, but to really change the mindset. But the six R's of indigenous OER, um, this came about particularly from some conversations in the open community. When you think about like, you know, on the surface, you want to say, I'm, a, I'm an advocate for open, make all the things free, make all the things, you know, be able to be redistributed and recopied and used however people want. And then we think, wow, like if I'm, for example, a, you know, um, white superintendent, and I am looking at um, indigenous knowledge, there can be an overtone of colonialism there if I say, oh, that's great. I'm just going to take it and use it and change it however I want. And off we go. Um, so there's been some really interesting work done. Um, Tara Robertson is a hero of mine who's done some of this work as well with both communities of color, indigenous communities and queer communities about what it means to reuse somebody's work. Um, so the indigenous six R's emerged from the idea that um, it's not just an open access regime. Um, this is maybe what some folks have called the tragedy of the commons, right? Where you just take your cattle to the free meadow and graze it down to dirt and you don't care if no one else can ever use it again because it was free, so you were allowed. Instead, we have to have some values that govern how we share and how we use things um, to motivate ourselves to keep the commons sustainable and equitable as we are using it. So the six R's of, of indigenous OER are particularly built for using um, uh, texts and content and approaches uh, from communities that you yourself do not belong to. Um, but also I think they're just a wonderful way of thinking about what some other folks in open have called the care model, um, which is the idea that when we have a commons, it needs to be steward, stewarded more by more than just an open license, not just a technical thing, um, but a set of values. Um, a way of thinking about this as well, when we're thinking about all the good we're going to do for our marginalized learners is to think about um, access being not just about access to knowledge. And this is where your president, I think, just hit it out of the park. And to be honest, sometimes when presidents introduce an open um, you know, uh, conference, you don't really know what's going to come out of their mouths. Like, do you know, did they just learn about this five seconds ago? And I really thought, there was a, a depth of understanding there about the fact that we're not just talking about making stuff free for, for underprivileged students, right? We're talking about giving all of our students access to knowledge creation, to be participants so that they are shapers of um, the world, not just consumers of it. And that brings me to the second principle of open pedagogy as we are working towards social justice and um, ac access and equity. We are also thinking about how our learners can be drivers in the educational process. So I tend to use the phrase learner-driven rather than student-centered. Student-centered is fine. It's just that it's become a little um, stale, I think, to us, right? So, you know, if you are advertising for a faculty position, every single person you interview will say, I run a student-centered classroom. But in almost none of those classrooms, including many of mine, <laughs> will the students truly be the center, right? You can just look at the architecture of the classroom. Where is your students, where are your students sitting? Where's your teacher sitting? Is this a student-centered presentation that I am giving right now? No, it is not, right? So um, I, we can't just walk around, because, you know, I can't just say, look, because I believe in student-centeredness, I am student-centered. I am not centering our students right now. You are the students and I, you are not centered. Um, so we have to like, you know, kind of think a little more radically about what would have to change if we centered our learners. So the first thing I did is sort of, change the wording, learner driven, like let's just use different words so we know we're talking about doing something maybe a little different. What would it mean if we involved our learners, not just in, you know, did you learn the stuff I gave you, which was free, lucky you, um, but did we let you design the processes by which you were to learn? 
things like the policies that govern your class, you know, uh, attendance, late work. Um, did we let you design your assignments and have choice in what content we were covering? Did you get to contribute to knowledge, which generally doesn't mean, did you write a paper that I alone read and then gave back to you, right? There's no real contribution to the world of knowledge there. Um, and if you're not contributing to knowledge, in what way is my promise that, you know, Plymouth State is creating world leaders who will change the world? You know, I'm sure you'll do that when you leave, but not here, right? Um, so the idea here is, do we really have to think a little bit about redesigning our um, learning environments, our syllabi, our approaches, if we want to mean it when we say student-centeredness? And this is the good stuff that comes by taking all of the R's more seriously, right? Um, not just that, oh, this has an open license on it, but wow, this is really permission to think about knowledge differently, which brings me to the last sort of leg of this um, stool that we're building here. Um, we want to think of knowledge as connected and collaborative. Certainly, it's one of the biggest gifts of open and the five R's to imagine that all of the content in your class um, is dynamic. And, you know, probably no one in this room or on this Zoom right now has a problem with that. But certainly some many faculties do have problems with this, right? They think my content is not, you know, constantly in flux. You know, I teach the law of gravity, right? Or they say, um, or like me, I might say, I teach early American literature, literature, you know, to 18, from, you know, 1830 to whatever. That literature hasn't changed. Um, but of course, we know that these, the, that those are wrong, because even if I'm teaching the same primary text, you know, from 1760, the frameworks by which we use those, talk about those texts in the field of English have changed dramatically, right, from uh, the 1800s to, say, 1950 to 1980 to today, um, radically shifting frameworks. The same thing is happening all the time. Um, just look at uh, planetary science and, and poor Pluto, right? So the idea that um, we... We, of course, want to teach our students, you know, facts and truths and all that stuff, but we want them to understand that their content is actually not quite as important as the scholarly and professional community that surrounds it. The current researchers and practitioners and publics that are interacting with that work and constantly learning it. So it's not enough to teach the law of gravity. You have to be um, brought into the community that is studying those laws and working with them and coming up with the slight shifts in methods and frameworks that are um, changing every 20 or 30 years, massive paradigms in those fields, right? So that's the way that we build lifelong learners. But right now we tend to say that we build lifelong learners in our mission statements. Um, but we don't necessarily have syllabi, curriculum, library instruction methods that assume that our students are going to be brought into these scholarly and professional working communities. We still tend to think our students as people who need to learn content, right? So the gift of open is to bring them into the communities, teach them the content as a function of community. Um, I will give you my famous and outdated example, but I, I still love it because it's it's practical and it, it's still paying dividends, which is the beauty of uh, most open uh, projects. I will talk a little bit about this project that I did with my students in my early American Lit class um, in, I think, around 2017. And my students were buying the Heath Anthology of American Literature. It was about $90 new and many students were buying it used. It's actually not very expensive as textbooks go, um, to be frank, but uh, when I learned about Open, which was around 2017, um, I, you know, when I really started 
understanding um, how open licenses worked, I realized that my students were paying $90 for a collection of public domain literature, you know, and I just thought, well, this doesn't seem right. Um, surely there is a way to get this into their hands for free. Um, but honestly, there wasn't an easy way. There was lots of stuff out on the internet in different places. Um, but I taught a 4-4 load. Some of you probably teach a 4-4 load. God help you if you're in a community college, you teach a 5-5 five -five or 5-5-2 five -five load. God help you if you're contingent faculty or an adjunct, you may take teach a 7-7 seven -seven load across three different institutions. So when somebody says, oh, this stuff all exists for free on the internet. Like, how much time do you have to go and find all that stuff and put it together, right? Not very much. It's one of the challenges of OER is that stuff might be there, but it's no easy feat to go find it, put it together, get it into your Canvas or whatever, your LMS. So I had this challenge, um, but I was sort of intrigued by the idea that maybe my students could help me do this work. So I put out a call um, over one summer and asked whether there were any students who wanted to help me build this anthology over the summer. Um, and I got about 10 volunteers and we made a little like Google spreadsheet about what text we needed to find. All of us together learned enough about copyright, I knew nothing, um, to figure out what we could take from the internet to use um, in a free book that we were making. If Thomas Jefferson is edited by somebody, we can't just take that for free, right? Because the edited version is not public domain. So it took a little bit of training, but uh, about 10 students and I put this together. Um, I applied for a small grant from my university so I could pay the students $100 each to help me. Um, I wanted, I, I think about $800 and I was denied. Um, so I paid it out of my own pocket. Um, I'd say this not to tell you that I am a martyr, but I am here to tell you that um, we built this for $800. And these days, there are ways to find $800 for open. Um, but the reason I, I say that I did pay the students is that I want to acknowledge that the work of building this was labor. Um, and we weren't in a class, so we couldn't do it as classwork. So, you know, labor is labor, even if it's academic labor. So we want to acknowledge that when OER is free to use, it doesn't mean it's free to create um, or, or free to curate. Um, so it's really important that we support our faculty um, who are doing this work. So this was not part of a class, so the students helped me. But by the time we got to fall, we actually had a pretty good little serviceable anthology. We called it the Open Anthology of Earlier American Literature. A um, bunch of students were, were uh, editors of, of it with me and off we went. And we thought we were pretty fantastic. Um, the students in the fall class, some of whom who had built the anthology, also thought we were pretty fantastic because the price of the course went from $90 to $0. Um, until they started using the anthology, and at which point they decided we were not heroes, uh, we were villains because they hated it. And the reason they hated it is like, you know, we start one of the first units we do, um, we do some uh, Native American oral texts, and I was horrified. Um, my students were still okay, but I was horrified because, of course, most of these oral texts were produced by white ethnographers in the 19th century. But like there were no um, ancillary notes to explain that to my students, you know, so my students were just like, you know, when the Wampanoag wrote this and I was like, oh, God, you know, what have I done? Um, I haven't given them the framework. So I had to do a lot more lecturing. And then when we got to like Cabeza de Vaca, who is a Spanish explorer who predates Columbus, he's down in Florida, for example, my students are like, you know, where's Columbus and where's the pilgrims and who's this guy and why is he in Florida? And so we just realized that the book was missing, um, you know, he's in Hispaniola. No one knows where Hispaniola is and there's no maps, right? So I'm just about to can this whole anthology because it really isn't working as well as the Heath. When my students and I get this, you know, obvious idea, which we thought was a great one at the time, which was, hey, maybe students can just start putting into this book, which we built ourselves, some of the stuff that it's missing. We were using Pressbooks, which is a free, simple um, tool. It's a little less free now than it used to be, but mostly free open source tool. 
Um, so we thought, hey, we could just, we could probably do this. So, you know, for example, when um, we got to, we were getting to Columbus, Hannah Hounsell, who was in the class, she read the Columbus ahead of time and did a research project on Columbus. And then she wrote a little introduction, found some public domain maps and built that so that when the class got to that part of the anthology, they could read Hannah's stuff and kind of have some support when they were doing Columbus. Um, this ended up being brilliant because Hannah's introduction, now remember, she has no experience with this. She's a, um, a sophomore, I think, at the time. Um, her stuff was better than the professor who had written the anthology, uh, the introduction in the Heath. And that was because Hannah knew exactly what pe students didn't understand about the Columbus framework. Um, so she was able to speak to her peers in a way that was incredibly comforting and accessible for them, I think. Um, and that was when we realized, oh my gosh, we have hit on something here. This is amazing. And we started to have a little bit more fun with the kinds of things that our students were putting into the anthology. For example, Jonathan was like, I don't really want to write an introduction. I like to make videos. Could I make a video introduction to the Haitian revolution? And it's like, can you? Yes, you can. This is amazing. So, you know, he would make these little two minute historical introductions that we would place before each of the like historical eras that we would do. And again, um, they were funny, they were interesting, and they were in the right language for his peers. Um, and at this time, we had also realized that the digital textbook that we were using, um, some students liked print and they printed it stuff out. Um, but in general, we all liked the fact that we had layered into the sidebar a little uh, free app called Hypothesis, which allowed the students to annotate in conversation with each other. So they could ask questions um, like, I don't understand this. What is he talking about here? Uh, a good example is with Columbus. He's always called in the third person, the Admiral, right? So students are like, is this by him? Did he write this? Who's the Admiral, right? So little things like that, they could clarify, but also they could, they could ask other questions. They could express their disgust and dismay, which was very important in our early American literature class. They could post gifts and funny videos, which they started to do frequently. By the time the semester had over, uh, Hypothesis was sort of new at the time. So they were watching my class as like a demo. And um, we had 18 students in that section. And by the end of the semester, those 18 students had put over 10,000 annotations into the anthology that they built. And there is no way that they were annotating the Heath anthology with 10,000 annotations. Um, so we just started having so much fun uh, right at the time that I decided to move to a different department and teach totally different courses. And I was so heartbroken because I was like, this is the best project I have ever done. Um, and now I'm going to abandon it. But the cool thing was we had openly licensed this little anthology. We knew it wasn't terrific, but, you know, it was a great pedagogical tool. Um, and so when my colleague Abby took over the course, she forked a copy of the anthology and her students kind of re-edited it, especially because she had a sustainability theme for her American Lit class. So they took a lot of the stuff um, and they wrote uh, sustainability focused introductions for a lot of the stuff that we had done, but they still used a lot of that work. So now my students were seeing that a lot of the stuff they had done as um, coursework in writing that stuff was being used by students who weren't even in their class. And they started to really feel like what they were, which was authors of the textbook. Um, then the project started taking on a life of its own. And we realized that because I would give some talks once in a while where I would say, you know, what I'm saying now, that people across the country started to use this little textbook. And I'm sure started to realize that the textbook wasn't always great. You know, some students were doing A work, some students were doing C work. Um, and, you know, that was okay. At the front of the book, it said, this is a student project, you know, take what, what's useful. And um, so Tim Robbins at Graceland University 
he took what was useful, which was a good chunk of, anth of our anthology and our student work. And he got a grant with the Rebus community um, through Hewlett. And they took on about 20 academics from all over the world, really. Um, and they are currently uh, building out the open anthology of American literature. So you'd be silly to use my original anthology now, but there's a million great ones out there, including Tim's version, which is coming out soon. Um, they still pay tribute to me and my students, um, but they are, when Tim's version comes out, um, it's going to replace the Heath Anthology, the Bedford St. Martins, the Norton Anthology of Early American Literature, and I don't think anyone will use those commercial products again. Um, I want to say this because the projects that you do in open with your students contributing they don't have to be perfect and your students are not going to be experts, um, but there's still so many ways that there are meaningful contributions to be made to fields, particularly in terms of education, um, where our students can do real work. And that is the gift of, of open pedagogy, which is so familiar to those of us who have done things with you know high impact practice all of these years. Um, I just want to run through a few other examples, some of which are kind of landmark examples, others of which are smaller, but I think just great. Um, one thing is uh, working with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is so interesting, of course, because all, so many of our students do research. And mostly when they do research, you know, it, it goes into um, a paper and then kind of dies there. Uh, Wikipedia is a giant research paper written communally by the world um, on a million different topics. It seems like a lot of the work that academia is doing could be contributing to make Wikipedia a more reliable resource since every one of us and all of our students are using it. Um, but what's great is there are groups, for example, the nonprofit WikiEDU, um, that will support you in helping your students work with Wikipedia. It doesn't mean your students have to author a whole Wikipedia page. I wouldn't even do that. And I have a bunch of expertise in different areas, and I'm way too intimidated to do that. Um, but there's so many smaller ways that students can interact and contribute to Wikipedia, and they will help you with everything, setting um, learning objectives for the project, training your students on the tech that they need to do it, helping you build assessments. And we have so many studies that show that if you work with, um, have your students contribute to Wikipedia, uh, that they're um, that they are going to have positive benefits to their learning outcomes. Um, there's also ways that you can involve your scholarly and professional organizations. Um, Nova is one for psychology. They run these little film um, contests, and anybody can contribute to them. And the cool thing is, undergrads can contribute short, you know, three to five minute films on different psychological concepts. Um, and then, it, first of all, they can win, including here where two undergraduates won $6,000. Um, but also uh, the winning videos become OER for people to use in, um, in their teaching or in textbooks that they might create, like Principles of Social Psychology, written by my friend Rajiv Jangiani. And one of the problems with this wonderful textbook when it emerged was Rajiv was using it, he was loving it, um, but some other folks were complaining that it didn't have the test banks that lots of folks were used to using when they taught social psychology. So instead of just saying, well, I guess I gotta go back to my commercial textbook and pay Pearson to give me these you know, test banks, uh, Rajiv just had his students one semester write uh, test bank questions. And I can't remember what it was, he had like, you know, one small class of students, and they wrote some ridiculous number of test bank questions. He said it was so valuable because they didn't just write the questions, you know, write the wrong answers and the right answers. They had to come up with three plausible wrong answers, which assisted them so much in their learning. Um, and then the next semester, they sent those test banks to the graduate students who went through them, checked them, edited them. And then in the third semester, it went to the computer science students who were able to build the test banks for the um, 
for the textbook so that now the textbook could have ancillary materials. So if you do teach a significant load of students and you don't have time to write a textbook, you still can have your students participate in so many ways. Um, you can contribute to the creation of OER by involving your students in projects that would be pedagogically beneficial, real world authentic learning projects that have great learning outcomes that can contribute um, to the field. Some of this work is going on at The Ohio State University where they use a, an a, uh, um, open textbook that is, you know, peer reviewed and, you know, formally written um, and that, and it's free. So that's great. Uh, but they also allow students to contribute to environmental science bites, which is um, current events and how foundational environmental science um, concepts and topics play out in current events. So every semester students are contributing to environmental science bites. And of course, there's always current events in environmental um, science. And also uh, they can assign students work to other students. So you can assign these things or you can have your students write these things and contribute to environmental science bites, which is a really motivating way for students to participate in their field. Um, if you are connected in the field of environmental science and somebody writes a really great piece for environmental science bites, you can drive that into your networks. Um, whatever platforms you use, whether it's Facebook or unmentionable platforms that look like this or Mastodon or other platforms, um, you can drive your student work into your professional communities and ask mentors and scholars from the field to interact with that student work, which is just beyond exciting for students. Um, there are so many open projects already in process that you can join. For example, Creative Commons has the open climate campaign. So if you work at all on um, climate science or, or meteorology or anything to do with weather um, or uh, sociology, sociological aspects of um, the climate crisis, you can jump right into the open climate campaign and have your students participate, whether it's in um, data collection or writing or analysis or um, just, you know, uh, responding to work that others are putting out. Um, I also want to talk about one of my favorite projects that I usually um, mention, which is the uh, Open Pedagogy Fellowship Toolkit, which is based, I said we would get back to the UN. Uh, the UN has sustainable development goals, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, but these sustainable development goals are the kinds of things that we have a poster in my teaching and learning center at Plymouth State. And when you look at them, um, you can automatically see like, oh yeah, these goals are all the different parts of our university curriculum. There must be ways that students could join up with this UN initiative. Um, how could my students join up? I wish I had some examples. Well, folks from Montgomery College have created this little toolkit to give you some awesome examples of how faculty are working with their students on projects that engage them with different ones of the UN um, sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. And the exciting thing is that later this afternoon, you can hear uh, the folks from Montgomery College um, talk to us. I assume they'll be talking about this landmark project. Um, but in general, um, it doesn't matter what college you are or who you are. Like, again, I'm from Plymouth State. Um, this is not a college that really a lot of people have, uh, you know, us put in the front of, um, you know, innovative higher ed work. It's a small regional public university. Um, but we have launched things that have now become really, really well known because uh, all it takes is a good idea and a willingness to share. And that's um, what's really come out of Montgomery College. Um, look at this wonderful project, um, an ethnic studies primer. What I like about this in particular, and again, links to all this stuff are in the slide deck, so you can go check out the projects. But especially with ethnic studies, they realized that, of course, it should be an open textbook because the point of ethnic studies is to look in some ways at marginalized voices, um, to let communities speak for themselves and not be spoken to. So it's important to have that open license that allows learners and contributors contributors to go in and contribute their lived experiences to these frameworks. 
Um, so that's a, a, a place where you just see um, content and community. You see social justice, you see the open license, you see the no cost, you see equity. And it's just like, this is amazing, right? It's and um, and so much more motivating for students and faculty. Um, in the final section here, I just want to talk a little bit about what this means for designing educational ecosystems. And when I first started um, teaching, I think like many of us, I was a little bit stuck in what I might call Alcatraz, which is on the left there. Um, that is the world of the learning management system. And God bless you if you use Canvas or whatever learning management system you use. I use it too here and there. Um, but it's very much hard to get in and hard to get out, right? Like you want to share something from your course. Lord knows the number of permissions you would have to, you know, figure out in order to get people into Canvas or get something, you know, shared outside of it. And I thought like there's a time and a place for that. But how does that jibe with all of this sharing, with connecting students to their learning communities, um, with the idea of um, letting stu students transform their worlds? Like, how does that work if everything is ubiquitously locked down in these learning management systems? I want to build driveways and pathways to places that have front porches where my students can invite collaborators to sit on the porch of their ideas with them and you know, mentor them, critique them, talk to them and support them. Um, so I moved into a program called Domain of One's Own, which is about getting students to work on the World Wide Web instead of lockdown and Canvas. Um, but it doesn't really matter how you do this or what tech you use or even if you use tech. It's really a mindset shift from thinking about an LMS where all of the work there at the end of the semester, you have to teach that class again. So you copy over your course and flush away and delete all of the work that your students did for that class. And your students know that that's coming. And that is a terrible symbolic approach to our students' work. So instead, let's think symbolically of how do we help our students produce work that we know matters. And it's not just um, how do we trick them into thinking their work matters. How do we help them make their work matter? How do we help them shape the design of it? Um, here you can see what we call an e-port, which is um, one of my students, Jane, who's a, a conservation ecology major, um, and she you know, builds a place to hold her work, to share her work and to collaborate with others. Again, it's not about always sharing publicly, it's about thinking more critically about the tools that we're using so we know that we are truly student-centered, right? Not actually giving lip service and then deleting all of our student work at the end of a semester. One of my students, Becca, uh, talks about how we light this fire for our students. Um, she talks about the kinds of typical structures that students are sick of. You probably know what kind of structure I'm talking about. Memorizing vocab words to, words to do well on weekly quizzes, submitting assignments to Moodle or Blackboard that disappear when you graduate, meaningless engagement with the work we produce. It makes university kind of a drag. I mean, meaningless engagement with the work that they produce, right? Even their own work does not meaningfully engage them. And she says, we wanna do work that's relevant to us. And I would suggest one of the ways we do that is by making, helping them do work that's relevant to the world. So more examples um, exist uh, of this kind of work. Rajiv and I built openpedagogy.org um, to serve as a clearinghouse for open pedagogy projects. Um, but as is the tradition with open, somebody um, a few years after we started it, and the project was languishing a little, there's lots of great stuff there, but um, we went on to do other things and it, you know, it was still live, but not amazing. So the Open Pedagogy Network built an even better clearinghouse um, and they thanked Rajiv and I for the inspiration. And so then Rajiv and I went back to the Open Pedagogy portal, uh, openpedagogy.org and we said, hey, this was a great project, but we want to kick you over now to the Open Pedagogy portal, which is even better. 
So again, it's that idea of continuous improvement, collegiality, and collaboration. Um, we would have happily just given them our portal, but they really built something, I think, that is a step up. So I highly recommend the open pedagogy portal as a place to find more open pedagogy um, ideas that don't just make, don't just use OER to make learning more affordable, but they think of access more broadly, including access to knowledge creation. And they think not just about the five R's, but also about the three R's of social, social justice and the six R's of indigenous, um, uh, using indigenous OER and just the values that drive a true knowledge commons. So to conclude, I'll just leave with you my perspective. You know, now I'm a library director and I work mostly with librarians and instructional designers, um, but really my journey is in many ways a journey of someone who, who teaches, whether it be faculty um, or students, um, it's someone who teaches and someone who cares um, about that teaching having a positive impact. Um, so when I started doing that work, I think I spent a lot of time in, in these three domains. The domain of knowledge, which is, you know, what is the content of the stuff that I'm teaching? What, what do I know that I want to share? But also, I don't just want to, you know, download that for students, like, you know, regurgitate it back to me. I want them to really understand what they know. Um, I want them to be able to ask new questions about it. Um, I, I want them to feel like they can ask questions about it that I didn't originally even teach them to ask. Um, and I also want them to be able to thrive with that understanding, which to me means being able to apply it. For example, if I teach something about um, you know, Native American history, and then they see the Dakota pipeline protests, I want them to be able to apply what their understanding of the Native history to the current contexts that they are seeing. And for probably 15 years, I spent most of my time very happily getting fine reviews in those three domains. So it was really exciting to me as a mid-career teacher to realize there were other domains on both sides of this um, little flow chart that I hadn't thought about. The first was that domain of survival before my students can even come to the table to learn. What are the barriers that are keeping them from accessing knowledge? Um, is the textbook too expensive? Can they not afford childcare? Um, did they not actually even enroll at Plymouth State because they can't afford a public education in New Hampshire? And I started to see it as my job as a PhD in early American literature to address those issues. I started working on food insecurity at my college. I started advocating for public funding in my state legislature. Um, these became academic issues for me um, because of that new domain that opened when I started to work in open. And then also on the other side of things, if I want my students to be able to apply their knowledge, then I don't th want them to apply it just as an academic exercise. I want them to make real contributions to the field. If they know something about native history and they can apply it to the Dakota pipeline, I want them to have avenues where they can actually do that if that's what they want to do. So the ability to actually contribute that knowledge and therefore transform the world, it's not something I want them to do when they graduate and go into the real world and get a real job. It's something that can begin on day one in my actual class as part of the assignments that we create together as we do the work. And that's ultimately how I think higher education can be a tool for equity and a key contributor to the public good. Um, we have to change the whole way that we think about open, not as an affordability um, and particularly a textbook affordability movement, but as a movement that really has the mindset that we are focusing on equity and on the public good um, and letting our learners participate um, in that focus with us. So I think now uh, we have just a few minutes for questions before I um, 
I released you to a break and I know we're, we're kind of hybrid here. So we've got online. I see stuff in the chat that I wasn't able to um, look at as I was talking. So is there someone other than myself who has an idea on how we might manage some questions and answers? So Robin, I came back up to the podium. Um, my colleague Jessica has been monitoring the chat. So I thought we'd start with a question from the chat first, and then we could go to a question here in the room in Purdue Hall. Uh, Jessica, do you have a question from the chat? One second here, we'll call one up. Thank you. In the meantime, can we say thank you to Robin? Yeah. Just, I, I, I can't underscore how well you set the stage for us um, today. Well, I, I certainly have, you know, I'm going to be around for um, some of the online stuff later. And I saw, um, you know, what's coming later in the day and, you know, it, it's, you guys are already doing the work. <clears throat> um, but I really am happy questions from anybody and they can be about this stuff or, you know, specific things. I see a couple in the chat just about some of the tech stuff that we're using and I'm happy to answer really, um, you know, nitty gritty questions as well. Jessica, do you want Robin to jump in on those? Well, yeah, please, I'm having a little bit of a hard time. Robin, do you wanna answer some of the questions that you're seeing in the chat? Um, I saw uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll just jump on that there were, um, some people are talking about um, press book stuff. I don't think this was a real real question, but um, I, I do wanna kind of underscore that one of the challenges of working in open is that we don't have a centralized ecosystem, right? So there's no one place to look for OER. There's no, no one place to publish OER. Um, that's very difficult. It's why we have to support, you know, all of our faculty and support staff as they're doing the work. But it's also a great benefit because once you centralize and monopolize, you consolidate the kinds of power that we are, you know, right from our land acknowledgement, trying to decenter, right? So as you're complaining about the fact that some of these things can be wonky and it can be hard to do this stuff, and, and I complain, I'm not saying don't complain, I complain all the time. Um, we have to also celebrate that it allows for more people to build more things in more unexpected ways. Um, so Pressbooks is a tool that I use. Um, it was originally fully free, it's open source. So what my institution did is we made an instance of it so that my whole faculty can now use it for free all the time. And that works amazingly to publish really like super simple books. Like you don't have to know how to use tech very well to make a, a book. Um, but it's a little challenging because I had to convince our IT people to get press books, which I did at the time, but I would never be able to do it now because IT is consolidated and we'd never get it. Um, so I understand it can be challenging to find your platforms. The biggest thing I can say as you're dealing with platform issues and how do I get this OER and how do I put it somewhere and how do I share it? It's just to remember that um, there are people who know how to do this. I'm one of them. You can, like, I'm a live person. So even when I leave this Zoom room, I still exist. You can write to me. Um, but you also have your librarians, your instructional designers, your tech people. So those support teams um, are, are places to go. So anybody has access to Pressbooks. It's just no longer completely free if you want to use Pressbooks.com. That's the question in the chat. So you can use it and um, I, it's really nominal. I think it's like 25 bucks for certain level of permissions. Um, so you can explore press books, um, but there are so many low and no cost ways to also um, publish and use OER. First of all, you can just use it, right? You don't need anything to use it. But if you wanna make OER, I mean, we've had people publish OER off of a Google doc, right? That you that you make available. Um, so I would suggest talking to the instructional design and academic technology folks at your school first to see what you have and what you could get access to. And then um, OER librarians and advocates who can tell you also what's available more widely that you may not have at your own institution. Thank you, Robin. And I'll just put a plug in for um... 
another avenue for us here in Maryland. So we have uh, Colleen, I think, is on the chat on the mm -hmm. on the Zoom this morning. Uh, Colleen McKnight is our OER Library Fellow for the most, um, and she is our guru in all things amazing around our instance of um, the OER Commons called the Most Commons. There is an authoring tool in that that's available. There are also lots of ways to upload materials that you've built somewhere else. Um, and she is happy to work with you. I'm happy to provide you with that information. Um, we have our most at, at, dot, most at usmd.edu email address. If you email that email address, we'll be able to point you to all the different kinds of people who could support you in um, looking at different types of platforms. Jessica, do you have a question? There, uh, there was a question. I, I don't know that it was for Robin necessarily. I think it was a testament to what Robin was talking about. And that is, how do you inactivate the LM, uh, the inclusive access tab in your LMS? <laughs> so, how do you deactivate it? Yeah, okay. yes. I mean, I, I will talk to that for just a minute. Um, a few things you can do on this. Um, the first is, you know, have compassion. <laughs> Not compassion, what's the word? Um, you know, be, be kind because a lot of faculty and administrators authentically think they're doing open education when they engage with inclusive access. And you don't want to come in and be rudely superior. I say this just because I know because I'm often rudely superior about this and it's not a helpful tactic. So you have to understand that they've been, you know, kind of hoodwinked into thinking that these are kind of the same thing as OER and that they're really good for students. The first thing to do is to go to inclusiveaccess.org um, to learn about inclusive access. It is a great site done by Spark that will tell you everything you really need to know to explain to somebody why this is not good for students. After you learn at inclusiveaccess.org what the issues are, then you can do things like go to your provost, make sure they understand. Um, I participated, like who would wanna do this, but I did it because I knew why it mattered, but I, I signed up to be on the committee that chose the next bookstore vendor, you know, for our campus to make sure that I knew exactly, it was Barnes and Noble is what got chosen. I voted against it, I didn't win, but, but at least I was able to look at the contracts, right? And participate in that. and. Um, and lots of people have done all this work before you so they can give you, you know, hints. But I would say understanding your bookstore contract, educating your administration. Um, then from there, you can talk to your academic tech people about how that got into Canvas and why it's there and whether it can be deactivated. Um, but inclusiveaccess.org is a great site for, you know, I think I had the student perg thing slide. It's a great report, but I should probably switch that out for inclusiveaccess.org. And I should also quote Rajiv Jangiani, who says that um, inclusive access is like leasing a fire extinguisher from a serial arsonist, right? So <laughs> they cause the problem and then they sell you the solution, which will exacerbate the problem in the, in the, in the long run. Don't hold back, Robin. <laughs> uh, one question from the room, Karen Purdue. Monica, I'll let you choose. Excuse me, Robin, I'm Chuck White. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I uh, And I appreciate your comments about inclusive access. For me, inclusive access has always been uh, that nobody was excluded from paying the outrageous price of this, <laughs> this product. Um, I was distressed to learn recently that one of the commercial publishers uh, is now selling an open, uh, an OER textbook, but wrapping uh, activities around it and still selling it to students uh, through the inclusive access programs um, for 50 bucks a semester. Um, yeah. You know, how do you react to this? Yeah, so you actually use the phrase there, right? We call that open wrapping. So there's two different phrases. One is open washing and one is open wrapping. Um, open washing comes from what, uh, it, it started with pink washing, um, which is what we do like during breast cancer awareness month where you can buy everything pink for breast cancer awareness with pretty much no money going, very little money going to breast cancer awareness. So they're using breast cancer actually to drive a profit to their companies. 
So the same thing with open washing, and that's what inclusive access is, right? They open wash it with the language of open to make it look like it's open to sell their commercial product. So the other thing that's happening now is called open wrapping, which is wrapping free materials in other stuff that you sort of ethically can charge for, right? Because there are other things. So some people charge because they've done the work of curating the open stuff and putting it all together. Other people have maybe added a little something um, to it. I'm sorry, my kid is texting me. I don't know how to shut it off if you hear that dinging. Um, so, so that's open wrapping. So I would say two things about open wrapping. One is, you know, part of the CC by license does allow anyone to do anything. And one thing you can do is you can wrap it up and sell it, right? Um, so a couple things that I would want to say about that. First is make sure faculty understand that if it's OER, you don't have to pay for it. Um, if it has an open license on it, you don't have to pay for it. You can get it free. So if they're paying and it's openly licensed, then they better understand what they're paying for. Um, so that faculty education is, first of all, really important. Um, I, I think the second piece with... Um, with open washing is to understand that perhaps there are reasons to use other licenses besides CC BY. Um, so I will tell you that my uh, my own license plate on my car, I actually paid extra for this, so it's really not open, but um, is CC BY NC. I've become increasingly more fond of the non-commercial license that allows people to take anything I produce as long as they're not selling it. Um, so there are licenses that you can, you know, advocate for if that's something that makes sense for you. There's con there's pros and cons of all of the open licenses, um, but the non-commercial license is available um, to help with things like, like open washing. Um, the last thing I will say is like, I don't suffer anybody the the um, right to make a living and academic labor is labor. So if somebody is using open ed to, to do something that they are truly contributing something and they're charging for it, you know, that that's their, that's their right. I just don't want people to ever think they have to pay for something that has an open license on it. And, you know, it's a little slimy if you make them think they do. Um, I am a. I, I do want to say I'm aware that I'm eating into your break, so I'm happy to stay here. Uh, well, you guys, tell me. Thank you, Robin. I think we will take our break, um, but I know we'll see you back at the featured sessions later today. And um, thank you for your generosity in spending time with us this morning and making yourself even available afterwards. Um, we're just so delighted that you joined us, and um, we'll see you a little bit later in the program. Great.